and it did finish. Okay, we are now recording. Let's go from current slide. And we'll go from current slide. There we go. And I may even turn on the project board. Okay. Before we get going, let me go through a couple of announcements. These are off in the future, not too far, but a little bit, about three to four weeks away. The first of these, the Lawson State Community College College Transfer Fair Days, boy, what a title, 2020, are coming up early, you know, early to mid next month. Wednesday, February 12th, uh, they will be on the Birmingham West Campus um, from 9.30 to 11.30. And if y'all are familiar with Birmingham West Campus, the academic building, which is that long building in that quad, you know, that gets in circle, uh, the long building in the back, uh, the B building, uh, they'll line up all up and down that hall, they'll have tables, and they'll be there for your viewing pleasure. Then the next day, Thursday, February 13th, they'll be here on Bessemer campus. And they'll be in this building, building A. Um, now they say the campus cafeteria between 9.30 and 11.30. I kind of doubt that. They may be there, but that's at the end of breakfast and the beginning of lunch. So it seems like a weird place to put it. It's not that big a cafeteria. So I'm guessing what they mean is the faculty staff dining room, which is just adjacent to the cafeteria. Still going to be pretty packed in there, but I think they can get everybody there. But they'll have more word coming later. Here are some of the institutions that have been invited to attend, and there's a bunch of them. I'll try to do it quickly. AUM, Mississippi State, University of Alabama, Montevallo, Alabama State, Alabama A&M, University of West Georgia, Auburn University, Jacksonville State University, Stillman College, William, uh, College, William Carey University, wherever that is, it's not in Alabama, I don't think. Uh, UAB, University of UAH, uh, University of West Alabama, Troy University, University of South Alabama, uh, University of Alabama College of Continuing Studies. So UA will be here as a college, a university, but also their College of Continuing Studies will have a table. Athens State University. UAB will be here, but also the UAB School of Health Professions will be here. I know we have a lot of students going into um, physical therapy, occupational therapy, a whole bunch of stuff that would be represented by UAB School of Health Professions. Uh, University of North Alabama, Sanford University, Alcorn State University, Kentucky State University, Tennessee State University, Faulkner University, Southeastern Bible College, Talladega College, and Georgia Southwestern State <coughs> University. Okay. A lot of folks are going to be there. Get your resumes ready. Um, put on your good, go to interview clothes, and you don't have to do that really. But, you know, plan to check them out. They're here recruiting you, so take advantage of it. Now, this next one is mostly for you who are more STEM-oriented, or if you like poetry. No, uh, okay. What this is, is a research program. This is from a guy at University of Illinois, and they run a research program for the Center for Power Optimization of Electrothermal Systems. POITS, okay. Believe it or not, the abbreviation, the acronym for that is POITS. So if you want to be a poet, in other words, in Power Optimization of Electrothermal Systems, uh, they are looking to recruit minority engineering students to work at three of the four institutions this summer. University of Illinois, University of Arkansas, and Howard University. Okay? Ten-week internship exposes undergraduate students to academic research in fields of mechanical, electrical, and material engineering. So if any of you are pre-engineering and would like to, uh, to look into this, they... It's a great learning opportunity. Fantastic. Ten weeks, they pay you $5,000 to attend. You don't pay them, they pay you. That's $500 a week to attend a great learning experience at one of those three universities. Not only that, they provide free housing for those ten weeks. Now, usually with free housing comes a meal plan. They feed you. 
for free for 10 weeks, okay? Pretty amazing, okay? They pay you airfare to get there and back once. They don't pay you to come home every weekend, but uh, they do pay you airfare to get you there and get you back. And then you gain access to weekly professional development webinars and other benefits. They have a brochure here. Brochure here. I printed it on my printer, which didn't come out great. And I had to print on front and back, and uh, it, it, you see somebody, well, anyway, that was printed there. There is plenty more in here. I'm not going to read it all, except for this. The deadline for uh, application is February the 15th, so just a little over a month away. Okay? Start putting this together, folks. If you're at all interested, you can certainly come up and look at this information. Uh, and start putting your package together. Great, fantastic opportunity. There are other of these REUs out there, that's research experiences for undergraduates, at various colleges and universities across the U.S. It's, check them out. They are great opportunities. Any questions on anything before we begin real pre-calculus algebra? You've been waiting with bated breath, right? Whatever that means. Okay. All right. Chapter 1. It's dealing with functions and their graphs. And if you remember the course description, it was, this course is the algebra of functions. So functions and their graphs, that's where we begin. 1.1 through 1.3 was a review of intermediate math, basically. Math 100 and those kinds of courses there. If you have any questions, if you're a little rusty on any of that, review those three sections. Come and ask the questions. We'll go over those. Okay? But we're starting in 1.4, which is functions, the algebra of functions. Here we go. Here are the objectives. We'll determine whether a relation between two variables or functions or not. And we'll use function notation. That's the first objective. We'll find domains of functions, whatever those are. We will use functions to model and solve some real-life problems. Most of the sections will have that kind of stuff somewhere in them. And then we'll evaluate a special situation called a difference quotient, okay? So, let's start with introduction to functions and function notation. This is, if you got your text, this is on page 35, okay, uh, section 1.4. Many everyday phenomena involve two or more quantities that are related to each other, okay? by some rule of correspondence. The mathematical term for such a rule of correspondence is a relation. They're related to each other, we call them a relation. Now, it doesn't have to be anything real special. For instance, you could relate your birth date to your height. Now, so, real special thing with that, but you could do it, that's a relation. Between two variables, your birth date and your height. Okay, two quantities. They're yours, okay? Both of those. Now, if you had started doing that when a kid was young, uh, then you would see there is a pattern there. Now, if you get our age, there's not much pattern left anymore. But uh, you could do so. a little bit better than the age to height, okay? Now, that's a relation. It doesn't have to have any real meaning. It's just two quantities related to each other. Now, in mathematics, Quite often we use equations and formulas to represent these relations. I bet you y'all know bunches of these. You probably couldn't say them right now, or some of you could. Uh, anyone know what A equal pi r squared is? Maybe not, huh? What is that? Anybody? How about A equal L times W? What's that? I can't hear. My hearing is Length times width. Length times width. Area is equal to length times width. That's if you got a rectangle. The length of a rectangle times the width of a rectangle gives you the area of the rectangle. You could do that to the floor or the wall or the ceiling. You know, area is equal to length of the board. Okay? Measure the length, measure the width, and all the together, you've got the area. I R squared, like this way, area of the circle. Okay? All sorts of formulas and equations. Those are relations. What's it between? Pi, uh, well, pi is a number, okay? The radius of the circle as opposed to the area of the circle. Small 
radius, small area. Big radius, big area. There's a relation there between those. Okay? <clears throat> For instance, here's another one. The simple interest. I don't know what this symbol is there for. Oh, oh, I know. That's a capital letter I italicized. That's what it is. <clears throat> the simple interest I earned on a thousand dollars, which I had it, uh, for one year is related to the annual interest rate, R, which, by the way, today is minuscule. <laughs> the interest rates are very, very low. You're not going to learn a lot, earn a lot, learn a lot, but you're not going to earn a lot because the interest rate is so low. But here's the formula, okay? I, the interest earned, is equal to 1,000, that's the principal, that's the constant, times the interest rate. And frankly, the interest rate is pretty low right now. But you do earn that interest rate. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if they increase the interest rate, you'll get more money the next year. If they decrease it, it's almost going to go to nothing, uh, you get less. Of it. So, this is what we call a direct relationship. We don't need to go into that now. Any questions? All right. Name, please. Hamilton. Hamilton. I've got two Hamiltons, which are you? C. C, the Criterion? <coughs> I thought it was, but I think the other one's here. <laughs> well, I thought I may have put the wrong name down. Or did you say Criterion or Keelan? Criterion. Okay, right. Keelan is already here. Good deal. Now, if you need a desktop, there's three, four, that are still, five maybe, that are still there, but you're lucky to sit there, too. What's that? I just see those. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? So this formula represents a very special kind of relation that matches each item in one set to an item in a, exactly one item in another set. Because if you change the interest rate, like I said, that's going to be more interest. Decrease it, less interest. Increase it, more interest. Whatever it, the rate is, when you multiply by a thousand, that gives you a exactly one value here. So here's your definition of a function. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Such a relation that matches for every element in the first set exactly one item in the second set, that's a function. So here's the definition. A function, now, mathematicians are very creative in their symbols. The symbol, most common symbol for a variable, of course, everybody uses X, okay? Few people use Y or Z or something else. But for a function, the most common one is F. Function F, okay? A function F from a set A to a set B. Set A here would be the interest rate. The set B would be the amount of your interest. Is a relation that assigns to each element, now they're going to call it our favorite variable X, in the set A to exactly one element Y in the set B, put old XY plane over there, um, exactly one element Y in set B. The set A, here we get that name now, is the domain or the set of inputs of that the function F can have. Okay? The set B contains the range, okay? Or the set of outputs that the uh, function can have. Okay, so that's several definitions in here. What is a function, the domain of a function, the range of a function, and the fact that the function assigns to each element in the first set, the domain, only one element in the right. Now, the first sort of practical illustration I have of this is let's imagine you're down in the bookstore. Okay? You got the munchies, okay? So you went and you bought a bag of potato chips. I think they sell potato chips somewhere, don't they? Whatever, you got something. But the person right ahead of you happened also to buy an identical bag of potato chips. Okay? And you're going through the line and you see them, they'll ring him up for a dollar nineteen, and when you get there it's a dollar fifty nine. Are you a happy camper? They were identical bags. No. 
that's not a function because that assigns to that bag of potato chips, that's your domain, two different outcomes. $1.19 for him, $1.59 for you. You're not at all happy. Okay? That would not be a function. You expect that to be a function. That if you buy exactly the same element, you're going to pay exactly the same price. So the, the element here would be your uh, back of potato chip. The element Y would be the amount you pay. You expect that to be a function. Now, I was a freshman in college before I, I think I had ever heard even the term function before. Unfortunately, Georgia Tech, when you go to there, except for one or two majors, your first quarter there, you're in calculus. There is no pre-calculus, okay, for most of the majors. So I was in calculus, and I had a great professor, fantastic professor, and he did this little illustration, and it helped me a lot. Maybe nothing for you, but it helped me a lot. He said, think of a function as a, and you're, you're actually, I can't get my pen to work. There it is. Okay. You notice they do this inputs and outputs, okay? Think of it as an output machine, okay? And here you have a funnel going into this box, and he used the term a black box, which is sort of a scientific type term, but here you have the output. So you put your input in here. These are things that come into here are from your domain. You put those in. Here is the function, okay? You turn the crank. And out comes the output. That's the, the set down here it goes to. That's the range. So for every input, you get exactly one output. And when he did this, all the reading of the book and everything else, I didn't know what they were talking about. But all of a sudden I said, oh, I think I got it. Because I grew up on a farm in uh, middle Georgia, kind of eastern part of middle Georgia. And uh, we raised cattle and chicken and pigs and had a garden and ate well. We didn't make a lot of money, but we ate really well. And every year, my dad would kill a pig. Coldest day of the year is when he tried to do that. And we processed it and did everything, scalded it. There was a whole bunch of things you had to do to it. And then when he got it all in, he would cut up the, the, the pork chop and the ham steaks and the various things like this. But there would always be little scraps, okay? A little bit of meat here, a little bit of meat there, something that yeah, sometimes had a little gristle in it, but that's all right. And he piled those in a pile. And those piles kept growing as he cut up the meat. And then we brought out the sausage grinder, okay? The sausage grinder, we fixed to the edge of the table, and it had blades in it in a certain way. And that was my job. I was too little and young to do much else, but I could turn the sausage grinder, okay? So, once we got all those, that pile of the little scrap meats there, then he would take those and they'd feed it into the sausage grinder. And they'd put in the meat, they would also put in the uh, seasoning, the sage, a little bit of hot pepper, you know, pepper and salt, you know, all that kind of stuff, put all that in. I would turn the crank and out would come the sausage. Inputs here, output there. That was a function, okay? Uh, pretty close to the idea of a function anyway. So that to me made sense. A little more sense anyway. Uh, so that's what a function is. You put in an input, you get an output. Usually something different from what you put in. Doesn't have to be, but it usually will be. Now, I'm going to get to this in a little bit, but I'm going to tell you now there are at least four ways to express a function. Here is one of them. This is called the mapping. Okay? And here is what we're mapping. We're mapping from the time of day, okay, in hours, afternoon hours, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. What we're going to do on the hour for those six hours, we're going to look at the thermometer outside. Or look on your cell phone or read the uh, whatever, okay? And you're going to read the temperature in degrees Celsius. Now, why would you do that? That's how most science and math deals with That's high system, not so. You can picture that as, as uh, Fahrenheit, too. 
At one o'clock, it happened to be nine degrees Celsius, which would be, let's see, let's just say close to 40 degrees. Probably not uh, a little bit cooler than the day. At two o'clock, it's raised to, let's say, 50 degrees. At three o'clock, it's up to 53 degrees. Okay? At four o'clock, it's still at 53 degrees. In fact, it probably rose a little bit more, but then came down. Five o'clock, it dropped to whatever that would be, and at six o'clock, it would be that. Okay? Now, we only had six inputs. We only went out and checked the, the temperature six times. The outputs, you could have had a whole bunch of outputs. In certain days, certain part of the country, you could be below zero, okay? Not here, not very often anyway, okay? Um, or you could have been, if you're down near the equator, they could be much warmer than that. But this just happened to be what they were at this place, at these times, on those days. Well, these are the inputs, so this set right here would be called the what? The what? The input, and what set would name would you have for that? The domain, exactly, that's why I had to cover it, okay? The set A is your inputs, those are your, your domains. Now, here is the set B, these are your outputs, and we don't know what to put there. They put all the numbers, I think, between 1 and... 16. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay. They put all those temperatures there. Now they're not going to use fractions, they'll just use whole numbers. Those are the set of outputs. Okay? Didn't think it was going to get less than 1 degree and not more than 16 degrees. Must be sort of a winter day. Okay, but not too cold. Well, we only use some of those. Now, does anyone see a little bit of a problem here? Yes. There's more than one input value from your domain that gives you the same output value. That's okay. All that matters is that for any input, there's only one output. And think about it. If you look outside right now, there's only one temperature, right? It's the temperature right now. Wait an hour and there'll probably be something different. But right now, it's the same. Two hours from now, it may be back the same as it is now. It's not likely, it's probably going to get a little warmer. But it's okay to have more than one output. No, one output for more than one input, but you can't have at any one input two different outputs. That's like two different, you know, $1.19, $1.59 bags of potato chips. You don't want that. You, for any input, it's only one output. All right, does that make sense? This is called a mapping diagram. That's one of the ways you can express a uh, function. Here's another way to represent a function. Same function that we just had. This is a set notation. A set of ordered pairs. Okay? Now, both of those words are important. Pair because there's two numbers. Right? One thing for the domain, one from the range. The other is that the order matters. Always the time first and the temperature is set, okay? And we had six observations, so those represent six ordered pairs. Here's a set of ordered pairs. At one o'clock, it's nine degrees Celsius, two o'clock, 13, three o'clock, 15, four o'clock, 15, five o'clock, 12, six o'clock, 10. Same representation, but you didn't have to draw a big picture, okay? This is a set uh, notation. Now. Here are some of the characteristics, so that's two. You can have a mapping notation or a set notation. So, here's uh, characteristics of a function. The set A, the input set, also called the domain, to set B, which is called the branch. Okay? Each element of A, one, two, three, four, five, those times, must be matched to an element in B. That's why you included a whole range of B's so you make sure you got them all covered, okay? Now, you don't have to have matched everything in B to A. You had a lot more possibilities there, okay? But every element in A must be matched with an element in B. Every element in your domain must be matched with some element in your range. Some elements in B, your range, may not be matched with any element in A. Yeah, yeah, we saw that, right? 
There was nobody at no time that was one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, five degree, six degree, seven degree, eight degree. Well, one at nine. Yeah. So some of these didn't get matched. That's okay. No problem there. Okay. Some element C may not be matched to an element A. Two or more elements in A may be matched to the same element in B. We saw that at three and four o'clock at the same temperature. That's fine. So they only have one temperature. Okay. And um, an element in A, the domain, cannot be matched with two different elements in B. You can't have two different temperatures out there. You know, you just can't. At any hour, there's only one temperature. That's, that's the same bag of potato chips. It's better have the same clock. Make sense? All right. Now, here are the four common ways to represent functions. I gave you two of them already. Kind of. Okay? One is verbiage. Okay? Verbally, by a sentence that describes it. Your height compared to your birth weight. Okay? And something like a birthday. Okay? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but you can make that relationship. You can do it numerically, either by a table or a list of ordered pairs. Now, we did it in a list of ordered pairs. We could have done that same thing. Now, I bet you you did this in, um, if you took Math 100 or one of those, maybe even 098, you may have done a T table. You did an X here and a Y there. X here and a Y there. For every input, you get an output. Okay? So you, that, could, that would be the table. So that, do those the same, order pair or a table. Okay? It could be a horizontal table, too. This looks like horizontal table instead of vertical. Whatever. Okay. All right. That's the second. Numerical. Graphically, you could plot those on the XY plane. Call them. I call it XY plane. The real name for this would be a Cartesian coordinate system. Anyone know why it's called Cartesian? Say again. Okay, it has four quadrants here, and this is Cartesian. Okay, it's named after a French mathematician and philosopher named Rene Descartes. So he took the last part of his name. He came up with this idea. He was the first person to relate geometry to mathematics. Before that, they thought those were two completely separate fields had nothing to do with each other. He related it. Called Most precisely, I would say the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. We always say the x axis and the y axis, okay? X, the horizontal axis always represents the input domain, and the vertical always represents the y Okay? And we often say x, y, but they don't have to be. It could be i and r, okay? And uh, interest in, in rate, okay? Uh, time and temperature. Okay. So that's graphic. Plotting the points on a uh, graph of a coordinate plane, which the horizontal axis represents the input values or the do domain, the vertical axis represents the values in the output variable values. And the other way, just like we showed i is equal to 1000 r, that's algebraic by an equation in two variables. And they don't have to be X and Y. I and R would be perfectly fine. Now, some functions, for instance, this one, that's going to be really hard to come with an algebraically corrected form because this is data. And data just do whatever they want to do. There is a little bit of a pattern here. One o'clock is a little cooler than two o'clock. It's cooler than three o'clock, but then at four o'clock they start coming down, but it's not even, okay? Uh, but there is a function there It might help. Take quite a bit of effort to come up with what that function is, but that represents the function. All right, any questions on four ways to represent a function? Okay. To determine whether a relation is a function or not, you must decide whether each input value matched with exactly one output value. That's where the rub comes. And if you have a huge set, that's kind of hard to do. That's where we use our algebraic expressions. That makes it 
little easier to analyze. When any input value is matched with two or more output values, relation is not a function. It is a relation, but not a function. Okay. Now, here is your first example. Okay. And this is on the bottom of page 36. Now, I'm going to be pointing out a few things to you. I, I can't remember if I did it the first day or not. But let me go on and, and rehash it a little bit. 100% free, okay? No charge, no codes, no nothing. You can use these resources anytime, anywhere, any way, any one can use them. You don't have to be in this class. You don't have to buy the book. One of these resources is LarsonFreeCalculus.com. This author has more free um, resources than any other author I've ever taught author I've ever taught from. And that's why I kind of like I don't like Cengage that much. I, his book is no better than any other except for these three free uh, websites. LarsonFreeCalculus.com. This has videos. This has worked out solution videos. Uh, I'll show you that in just a minute. Diagnostic tests, editable spreadsheets, it's editable, you can edit them, not, you don't eat them, okay. Uh, and profits, okay, if you want to do that. There's another free site called calcchat.com, and this has office of students uh, worked out solutions to the odd number exercise at the end of each session, okay. And then there's a calcu.com, which is, takes some of those odd number exercises and actually presents a video solution for those exercises, okay. And you can actually watch someone do it. The other are just written out. Uh, these were viewers. So I'll get to why I mentioned that in a minute. Okay. So let's determine which of these relations represents y as a function of x. So here's the first one. The input value x is the number of representatives from a state. Does anyone know how many representatives the state of Alabama has? It's either eight or nine. I'm not sure. It's a pretty good guess, right? Okay. Georgia would have a few more. It's ten or eleven, something like that. South Carolina may have less. I mean, just Mississippi probably has one less. Or something. Okay. Anyway, the number of representatives in the U.S. Congress from a state. Okay. The output value y is the number of senators that that state has in Washington D.C. Is that a relation? Of course, it's a relation, but is that relation also a function? What do you think? Say again? Is a function? Okay, everybody agree? Some, uh, some people are shaking their heads, maybe not. Well, let's think about it. <coughs> Alabama, for instance, let's just say eight representatives. I don't know if that's right or not. How many senators? Two. Any other number other than two? No, just two. Okay? Pick another state, Georgia, let's say they have 12. How many senators? Two. Any other number? No. California. Oh, goodness gracious. Probably 100 and something, uh, I don't know, 65, something like that. How many senators? Two. Okay, guess what? For any input, any input here, there's only two outputs. Okay? Guess what? That's only one value. Now that's a special kind of function. That function is called the constant function. No matter how many representatives you have on the x-axis, your output, the senator, is two. Okay? Now, guess what? Nobody has negative representatives, so we only use a little bit of this there. No one has zero. Well, we won't go there. Okay, no. No one has zero. So every state in the union has, there are a few states that only have one. Wyoming, I know, only has one. I think Rhode Island may only have one. Some of the really small population states only have one, so they don't have two senators. Okay, states with eight would have two senators. States with ten would have two senators. States with sixty-five would have two senators. That's a constant function. From greater than the input is any state. Um, if there's going to be integers greater than zero, the output is a number two. Okay, it is a function. Any one input, any state in the union has two senators. Okay. Only one number of senators, and that number is two. Now, 
you might argue, well, but maybe some senator died and they haven't elected a new one. Okay? Well, maybe that senator for state for a few days or something may only have one, but they still only have one senator. So it may not be a constant function. Maybe one state has something else. Uh, generally, that will be the case. So that is a function. How about this one? Here's your input. This is a tabular form. Um, this is a statement, a verbal statement. This is tabular form. Uh, is that a function? Yay or nay? Yeah, I hear no's. Why not? Ha! For input 2, this one has 11, that has 10. That's that unfair bag of potato chips, isn't it? Okay? No, you don't want that. This is not a function. It is a relation, but it's not a function. Because for one input, you can have two different outputs. These are perfectly fine. Now, here's a graphical representation. Now, this takes a little more thought, perhaps. What are the input values for this graph that you see here? A little louder. Okay, the input value. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Those are your input values. What are your output values? 3, 0, negative 1, 0, 3. There you go. Is that a function? Yes, it is. Here's how you can tell. Graphs make it so easy to tell. If you pick every point or any point, any point on the graph and draw a vertical line through it, see if any other point intersects. They don't. Vertical lines through those points only intersect with those points. If this had a point up here, that would not be a function. Yeah? C? Oh, okay. Uh, the one I'm just talking about. Okay. Um, it is a function because for input, okay, there is no input at negative 3. There is no value there. So your only input values are negative 2. Remember, input values are on the horizontal scale. When x equals, yeah, x equals negative 2, x equals negative 1, x equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals 2. Those are the x values. Your y values, your output values, or 3, negative 1, I mean 3, 0, negative 1, 0, and 3. Those are the y values corresponding to those things. Sure, for two different x's you can have the same y, no problem there, but for any given x there's one and only one y. Like I said, if you had another point right up here, then that would not, not be a function because you have one input, negative 1, with two possible outputs. Can happen. Not to be a function. This one, though, is a function. Does that answer it? Okay. Now, let's see how they answer them. A, the verbal description does describe y as a function of x, regardless of the value of x, how many representatives you have, the value of y is always two. Two senators for every state in the union. So that's called a constant function. Doesn't matter how big or how small a state you are, you've got two senators. That actually contributed to the Electoral College debate in the last presidential election that people were pretty upset at. One candidate got about three or four million more votes than the other, but because of the Electoral College, which is based on senators and representatives, so small states had more votes than big states, so to speak. Uh, the election did not reflect the popular vote. Not the only time that's happened, but it happened last time. All right, B. That table does not describe y as a function of x, because remember, the input value 2 matched with two different output values. Can't happen to be a function. Okay? And then the C, the graph does describe y as a function of x for every input, Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. One and only one y value. Even though the same y value had two or more inputs, that's fine. No problem there. 
okay? Two or more hours of the day will have the same temperature. No problem there. But at any time of the day, you only get one, one temperature. Okay. Any questions before we move off of that? Now, here's why I mentioned what I did earlier. As soon as you see an example in the text, immediately under that, you'll see a check mark. And it has a little symbol there, and it says, Audio video solution for the checkpoint is available at washingtoncalculus.com. So here's what I recommend, okay? I recommend as soon as you get out of class and have, don't have another class, at least do the checkpoints. While it's fresh on your mind, because these are very much like the example we just did, so do those as soon as you can. And if you can't get the answer, go to washingtoncalculus.com and reinforce that. That way, you are reinforcing what we just did in class. I know when I'm up here, it's a blah, 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 okay? But you go to do the checkpoints, it becomes good. That's at washingtoncalculus.com. Now, um, this goes to the top of page 37, if you're following the text. Representing functions by sets of ordered pairs is a common in what we call discrete mathematics. What they mean by discrete mathematics, you have a finite number of ordered pairs. It's discrete. It's not infinite. Okay. You can't represent an infinite set by a set of ordered pairs. You can't write an infinite number of ordered pairs. Okay. But for discrete mathematics, ordered pairs or t tables work quite nicely. Now you can use t tables to and just fill in the gap between the two. And you did that probably. In algebra, however, it is more common to represent functions by equations or formulas involving two variables. Here's an equation. Y is equal to x squared. Well, is that a function or not? What do you think? Say again? Y is equal to x squared. Okay, now I'm going to feel like a cheerleader up here. Give me an X. Give me an X. Sign four. What would Y be? Four squared is 16. All right. So you got one answer. Okay. Give me another X. Say again. Six. What would Y be? 36. Okay. For any given X, there's only one Y. Only one one. Okay? Now, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead. Well, not too far ahead. Uh, what is the domain of that function? What values could you choose from for your x? All real numbers. Exactly. Any real number. You can plug in a real number x squared, you get a real number y. Okay? But, what is your range of that function? Okay. It's a little more thinking. All real numbers that I hear someone say? Okay, not quite. Say again? All positive real numbers. Well, all non-negative real numbers. Because if any x you put in here, positive x will give you a positive y. But a negative x also gives you a positive y. So these are non-negative y. So your domain, all real numbers, your range, all numbers greater than or equal to zero, all non-numbers. Yeah. What's this again? Okay. I didn't quite hear what. Now this is x squared. When you say x2, that would be a subset. Okay, what did you say now? I said x No, okay. Uh... This would be discrete mathematics if you only had a fixed number of x's. If you said we're only going to take x 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, just like we did on the temperature, on the times, if you had just a discrete number, then that would be discrete mathematics. If you write it this way, no, all real numbers, infinite in both directions, that would be discrete. Okay? Now, good question. Okay. The variable y is a function of variable x. 
Now in this equation, x, we say is part of the input, because what did I yell out? Give me an x! Pick any x. That means x is what we call the independent variable. Give me any x in the world. Okay? That makes it independent. However, y depends on what x you give me. Because uh, if I said negative 3 for y, you can't give me an x that gives you that, okay? Because you can't square x. So you see, x would be the independent variable, y would be the dependent variable. So here's another deal. The independent variable, those are members of the domain, the dependent variable, members of the domain. Okay. So, a lot of different things. In, input value, independent, the output value, dependent variable. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yes. That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, while she's getting that down, right across from that on page 37 is a really handsome character, isn't it? Okay. Uh, many considered Leonard Euler, it looks like it would be Euler, but they pronounce it Euler, uh, a Swiss mathematician to be one of the most prolific and productive mathematicians in history. Uh, one of the greatest influences in mathematics was his use of symbol, uh, symbols and notation. For instance, he's the one that came up with what we're going to do on the next slide or two, function notation. We can blame it on him. Okay. Now, I think I've heard a couple of interesting stories about him. I, I believe I'm right on this. Um, his dad was, I think, an accountant or a bookkeeper or something like that. And when Euler was like a very young child, he would like to go in and play around with his dad and watch what his dad was doing. And one day he went in and said, Dad, you made a mistake there. I mean, he was only like three or four years old. He already understood math well enough to tell his dad, who was a professional at it, whoops, you made a mistake there. I went, what? Okay. Now, he may have also been the one, one of these guys, I get a couple of them crossed up, uh, when he was in, like, what would be equivalent to our first or second grade. Uh, now, this may have been Gauss, but those two are really brilliant people. The teacher, believe it or not, really didn't want to teach. He wanted to give them busy work to do so she could, or he, I think it was probably he, could, you know, kick back. He was tired. He had a rough night. I don't know what it was. He say, "Okay, pull out your, your 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 tablets, your piece of paper, whatever, and I want you to uh, add all of the numbers between one and a hundred. He said that'll keep them busy for a while. Well, within a few minutes, it was either Euler or a Gauss turned in the answer. What? <laughs> and it was right. How did he do it? He wrote the. He just imagined it." Let's say 1 and 100. What are those two added together? 101. 2 and 99. 101. 3 and 98. Yeah. He did that and just went uh, 101 times, I can't remember if it's 50 or 51, and then I think 50 didn't have one, so he just added that. In. He did it like that. Okay. Brilliant kid. Okay, that may have been this one. Okay, I can't remember for sure. Uh, another thing, I'm pretty sure this is about Euler. Toward when he got really up in years, he was still brilliant in mathematics, but he lost his sight in one of his eyes. The other eye wasn't very good, and in a few years, he lost his sight in the other eye. Guess what? He kept publishing papers. He'd have to get someone else to write it for him. But he was dictating to them to do it. He could do all of this in his head. Incredible guy. Now, why did I go into all that? Well, I've already mentioned one name, Rene Descartes. Here's another one. And um, sometimes there's other things listed here, too. You can write. Those could be your paper topics. And remember, you are going to get me your paper topics if you haven't turned it in already this week, right? Okay, so keep that in mind. All right. So, and you can scan through the book, anything you find in the book like this, that could be a, a paper topic. Now, 
the next slide is this one. And if you're following in the book, that is, uh, no, I'm sorry, we can do this one. The domain of a function is set of all values taken on by the independent variable, remember I said that, uh, x, and the range is the function is a set of all values taken on by the dependent variable y. So different ways to look at them, input, output, uh, independent, dependent, domain range, okay. Now, this is where I, I, I want to pause before here. Notice here it says when using. This is page 37, about two-thirds down the page. What they did, they skipped example two. So I want to go back and do example two, and that's probably going to be the most white space that we have. So let's do example two. Now, time out again. Example two, notice right under it, it says, see LarsonFreeCalculus.com for an interactive version of this type of example. That's going to be one of those videos that goes through this type of an example. So he has all these resources. Not every example has that. Every checkpoint does, but not every example does. This one, the example does, and the checkpoint does. Okay? Here is what they say to do. Determine whether each equation represents y as a function of x. So here's what we got. The a part here says x squared plus y is equal to 1. Okay? And it says determine whether that equation represents a function, y as a function of x. Now, can any of you just looking at it know that? You might be named Leonard Oil. No, I'm sorry. No. Any, any ideas? Yes or no? Or don't know? What's that? Well, you can ask it. It's okay. I don't want to assign you. What's the question? Oh, I Oh, okay, wait, okay, no, okay. It's x squared plus y is equal to 1. Do, the question is, does that represent a function? Yes or no, okay? Can you tell just looking at it? it you'd say it is. Those that said yes, you're right. Here's how you confirm that. Now notice how we represented the functions before. Look at that. y is equal to x squared, okay? This one, uh, this one, i is equal to uh, 1,000 r. Notice what they did on both of those. You put what you were expecting to be the dependent variable, isolate that, and see if you can make it a function of the independent variable. So that's what we do here. If I can get back to it. Okay. Since we want to know, is y a function of x? That's the question. Well, let's solve for y. How would you do that? Subtract x squared from both sides, right? Those go to 0, and you get y is equal to 1 minus x squared. Now you ask yourself, can you come up with any x that when you square it, subtract that from 1, it gives you more than 1y? One no. Any x you put in there? It'll give you one y. Right? Yep, that's the function. So you are absolutely right. If your intuition or reasoning gave you that, you're right. Let's look at B. And here's the thing that bugs me. To me, this is probably the most important example they have, and they didn't show it on the slideshow. Okay? Here's what. Minus x plus y squared is equal to 1. And the question is, determine whether each equation, this equation, represents y as a function of x. So what would we do? Solve for y. And what would you get? How would you do that? Add x to both sides. And that goes to 0, so you have y squared is equal to 1 plus x. And then what would you do? I don't want to know what y squared is. I want to know what y is. Take a square root. So you take a square root of this, you get y. What do you get when you take a square root of that? 
square root of 1 plus x, except for one fact. Any time you take the square root of both sides of an equation, what has to be here? Say again? I can't do it. Plus or minus, is that what you said? Yeah, well, that's what you said. Okay. All right. So we'll pretend. Any time you take the square root of both sides of an equation, okay, so let's say this was y squared is equal to 4. Take the square root of this side, you get y. What's the square root of 4? 2 or negative 2. So if you square negative 2, you still get 4, right? So guess what? This is plus or minus the square root of 1 plus x. Guess what, team? Give me an x. How about 3? 1 plus 3 is 4. The square root of 4 is plus or minus 2. So for any given x, have some of them could have two y. Not a function. Not a function. Okay? So this one is because for any given x you only have one y value. This one for any given x you could have a plus or a minus y. Okay? Not a function. Does that make sense? That's the key to how to do it. They really don't go into what you do, they just say, yeah, you do this and blah blah blah. But that's how you do it. And guess what? There is a checkpoint. And after class, try to do your checkpoint. And uh, if you can't get it right, well, if you want to check and see if you got it right, go to LarsonPreCalculus.com. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, picking back up where we had that off before, and using an equation to represent a function, it is convenient. Now, remember, I don't have a my watch, the battery died, so I don't have a watch on. So y'all gonna have to let me know when you get close to 915. Oh, 945. 950. 945, right? How, how are we doing? How much? 935. We've got 10 minutes. Okay, good. When using an equation to represent a function, it is convenient to name the function. Fred. No, 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 not that. Anything else. Okay. Uh, to name the function for easy reference. For example, you know that the equation y is equal to 1 minus x squared describes y as a function of x. That was the first part of that last example, wasn't it? I think it was the a part. That's a function. So you want to give it a name. And of course, their favorite name is f, function f, okay? So here's what we say. We're going to name y f of x, because x is the independent variable. So y depends on the x, so y is a function of x, so we call it alpha of x. And this is what we blame Leonard Euler for. He came up with this. If your input is x, your output is f of x, your output is y, so f of x equal 1 minus x squared. And to me, it's the most important thing to remember in this course. Okay, and here's what it is y is equal to f of x. If you remember that, you've got most of function down. Okay? Now what does this mean? <laughs> this is your input. Whatever that function represents, you put in an x, you get out a y. And your y is equal to f of x. Okay? And you know how to plot things in xy coordinates. Now you know how to plot them in function notation. y is equal to f Remember that. Over and over and over, I'll ask you. Okay? Any questions on that? Okay, everybody got it? Nope, oh, something's still right. Please don't let me leave the screen too fast. Say, hey, go back, go back. I'll go back. I don't have any objections to that. All right, everybody got it? No? Or yes? All right, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, everybody? Got it?
The symbol f of x, and this is real nitpicky, don't worry about this too much. Symbol f of x, you can read this as the value of the function at the value, at the value of x. Okay? The easy way, f of x. <laughs> Rather than putting all those other words, f of x. The symbol f of x corresponds to the y value, just like I said. y is equal to f of x. Remember that, you've got most of the function notation knocked out. Okay? Keep in mind that f is the name of the function, where f of x is the value of the function in some value x. Okay? So here's another function. We use the same name for lots of different functions. You don't do that within one problem, but within different problems, you're fine. f of x is equal to 3 minus um, 2x. Okay? That's the function notation. Now, the question is, what do we mean by f of minus 1? What would you guess? Say again. Okay, instead of the variable x here, we put minus 1. So that is exactly that. And that would be 3 minus 2 times negative 1. Perfect. Just everywhere that you had an x here, you put a negative 1 in its place. Okay? And what would that be then? 3. Second. Negative 2 times negative 1. Help me. I can't hear. Second. Negative 2 times negative 1. Second. Yeah, it's plus 2. And 3 plus 2 is? 5. There we have. Alpha of negative 1 is equal to 5. Input, output. Okay? Anything you see in parentheses, that represents the independent variable, the thing that was there to begin with. Okay? How about this one? Alpha of 0. What would that be? Say again. 3 minus 2 times 0. 3 Minus, and what's 2 times 0? Zero? 0. 3 minus 0 is? 3. Okay, you didn't have to string it out like that. I love zeros, so because all you have to do is wipe out that f of x equal 3. Okay? So easy to do. How about f of 2? What would that be? 3 minus 2 times 2. And what would that be? 3 minus 4 equal negative 1. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Y'all are good at this. Do you see how that works? Any questions? Any mystery meat in here? Okay. Give me any x in the world, you can calculate f of x. Okay? That's what a function does for you. That's the, the sausage grinder. Whatever you put in, do it. Do that same rule, whatever that rule is. Okay, now, let me, while we're here, ask you just a couple more questions. What's the domain of that function? If they don't specify, what would you assume the domain would be? Always assume this to begin with. All real numbers, exactly. Okay, now, let's consider what might be the range of that function. All real numbers as well. Now, I'm going to jump a little rabbit here. This function has a, is, is, you can name several special features on it. The one I'm thinking of now is a linear function because the maximum exponent, the only exponent for x is 1. That makes it a linear function. That means it's going to be a line. And can anyone remember what some characteristics that line would be. Remember, this is y is equal to this. f of x equal y. The coefficient of your x, and that exponent is 1, is called the. Ooh, I forgot that already. Okay, the slope. Remember, the standard equation for a linear function is mx plus b, where m is the slope negative 2, that means it's going downhill, and b is 3, that means you start from 
positive three. So Y intercepts the positive three. And then you go down two for every one you go over. And that would be your function. You got plot for the range of Z? All the way down. Probably for an infinitely small, infinitely large. Okay. You didn't need to know that yet, but I thought, why not? No extra charge. Okay. And here's how they just did the ones we did. Did we get five here? Yes. Did we get three here? Yes. Did we get four, five negative one there? Yes. Does anyone want me to go through how they plugged in? Everybody got it? Does it make sense? All right. Although F is often used as a convenient function name, and X is often used as the independent variable, it doesn't have to be. You can use any other letters for either one. Okay? Just don't use the same for both. Don't use x of x. That doesn't make any sense. So f of x is equal to x squared minus 4x plus 7. This is a function. Here's how you can think of it. It takes whatever is in here, the x, it squares it first, then it subtracts four times that same number from that square, and then adds 7 to the result. That's the function. The function does that. That's the sausage grinder. It takes whatever you put in, squares it, subtracts four times it, and then add 7 to that. That's the function. Now, what if you had written this list on? f of t is equal to t squared minus 4t plus 7. That's the same function. It's doing the same thing. It's taking what you put in, squaring it, subtracting 4 times that, and adding 7 to it. Same function. Okay? Now, this sounds a little bizarre, but it's true. It makes the independent variable a dummy variable. You can put anything in there. Uh, or you can even change the name of the function too. If you said g of s is s squared minus 4s plus 7, guess what? It's the same function. It takes what you put here, squares it, subtracts 4 times it, and adds 7 to it. Same function. It doesn't matter. They all define the same function. So the role of that independent variable is just a dummy variable or a placeholder. Now, I can remember somebody saying, you could put a stick man in here. Alpha stick man would be stick man squared minus four stick man plus seven. Same thing. Whatever variable you want to put there, you can make up a, a symbol and it works. They do put a block there. Four times, I mean the block squared minus four times a block plus seven. Same function. All right, good deal. Let me give you a few homework exercises because we did do a few examples. Now this is a long section. You can do either 5 or 7. They're both at calcchat.com. Remember that's one of those websites. 7 is also at calcview.com. Uh, you can do 9. It has four parts. It's at calcchat. Um, you can do any of the odds 11 through 17. They're at calcchat. And then you can do any of the odds 19 to 29 they're all at Calc Chat. Oh, by the way, 11 is also at Calc View, and 9 through 29 are all at Calc Chat, and 21 is at Calc View. Uh, in a table, you can do 31 or 33. They're both at Calc Chat, and we'll stop there and pick up the rest of those next time. Which way on Second? Okay. Uh, either 5 or 7. 7. Nine, you, you choose. Do as many as it takes to say, hey, I got this, you know. And you can use um, about the count chat and count view to let, and your answers in the back. Uh, any of the odds, 11 through 17. And any of the odds, 19 through 29. And either 31 or 33. Stop there. We'll pick up the rest of those next time. Say again? All those... Two web, okay. So the homework exercises, it's calcchat.com. All the odds are found there, and calcview, calcview.com. That's where those selected ones, that would be number 7, 11, and 21. Those are the only ones that are at calcview.com. 7, 11, and 21. Okay. But you, when YouTube video gets up there, you can hear me say it every time. All right. Good deal. Good class.
Yeah. Fire away. Second. Pages uh, 44 and 45. Not all of 45. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. These are all in the book. They'll be in the ebook too, I think. And they're all at CalpChat.com. The oddments. The oddments are at CalpChat.com. And those three right there are at Oh, you mean the. Uh, you're. you're Thinking the uh, web assigned codes? Is that what you're thinking? Okay, now these, the exact problems won't be on web assigned, but there'll be some like it there, and that's on the uh, It's not on the syllabus, it's in Blackboard. But it's a syllabus, locator card, research paper instructions, and then somewhere down there it says web assigned key. Second. Yeah, okay, yeah, you have that for free, uh, but as soon as you enter that code, you got it for the whole term. Yes, I have Oh, okay, so, yeah, yeah, you got it, that for free, yeah. As far as I know, you'll be fine. Are those numbers right there, are those the ones that are going to count Are these what? Are these numbers right here, the ones that are going to count Yeah, the odd numbers are all on count set, okay? The, those three right there are on, on top of you. Okay. Morning. Okay. I'm not going to be in the office. Well, I only got class all day today until I, thought, I told you that. I'm, on Tuesday and Thursday, I'm in class from uh, 8.30 in the morning till 5.45 in the evening. And I have, I think, two 15-minute breaks and one 30-minute break. And that's all. I mean, I'm sorry? Well, now that's up to you, but I can't have things, you know, necessarily have. That's when you... Go around and see if you can help any of the others. Okay. okay? All right. There's the key. Now I won't be down there until after the next class. Well, it starts at, at uh, nine, no, at ten o'clock and goes to eleven fifteen. At eleven fifteen, I'll have to come swap out books. That's all I have time to do then.